Okay, I think it's time to start. So let me welcome our lecturer, Mr. Rafał Bua from the University of Katowice, University of Economics in Katowice. And he will give you a lecture about the efficient market hypothesis. Uh, during the lecture, you can have uh, questions or comments. So if you go to the right, right top of the screen, there is a questions and comments button. If you click on it, you can write a question or comment, but Rafa will answer them after the lecture. So during the lecture you can write, but the answer will be after the lecture. OK, so that's probably all from the from the information about how it will be. So now I'm passing a word to Rafael, who will start with the lecture. So the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for the uh, invitation to take part in the International Week. I would like to share with you a few uh, a few things, a few comments about the efficient market hypothesis. So we are going to uh, deal with the problem of functioning of financial uh, markets. I will give you a maybe a shorter or longer presentation, and I hope that you will enjoy the time uh, spent with with us during during this uh, presentation. So. Our title of the presentation is Inefficient Capital Markets, Efficient Micro Hypothesis, the first pillar of asset uh, pricing. And uh, what is the agenda for our uh, today's meeting, for our today's uh, lecture? So first I would like uh, to introduce um, the winners of the Sveriges Riksbank Prize in Economic Sciences in memory of Alfred Nobel. 2013, the so-called by me Wolves of Wall Street. Uh, then we'll briefly discuss the history and the its concept uh, itself of market um, efficiency. Then we'll go into a detailed analysis of this term, the term market efficiency and its understanding. I would like to also, because it is commonly uh, misunderstood, I would also like to discuss with you uh, myths regarding market uh, efficiency. Moreover, because it is uh, quite a controversial issue, uh, I would like to present you the uh, opposite point of view presented by a co-winner of uh, uh, the prize in economic sciences in memory of Alfred Nobel 2013, Professor Robert Schiller, and then we'll um, discuss some problems um, uh, post uh, post by me and post by the last uh, financial crisis. So let's start today's uh, our today's lecture. So in uh, the year 2013, uh, as usually the prize in economic sciences in memory of Alfred Nobel uh, was given, and three scholars were awarded uh, were awarded this uh, prize. Professors. Uh, Eugene Fama, Professor Robert Schiller, and Professor Lars uh, Hansen. And what was the contribution uh, to the economic sciences they were awarded uh, for? Uh, at it, as it was emphasized by the Nobel Committee, uh, it was the empirical analysis of uh, asset prices, the in-depth analysis of the functioning of financial markets uh, from the theoretical and methodical point of view as well. So now we may um, now we may move on to the main ideas lying behind this um, this 2013 uh, Nobel Prize. Uh, so uh, as it was said, the research in the 60s, 70s and 80s, uh, they reached an important and lasting insight about the determination of uh, asset uh, of asset prices. So this is the theoretical point of view of because they proposed in reality, Professor Fama proposed the concept of market efficiency. Professor Schiller was the uh, on the opposite side of the uh, of the fight uh, against the, the market efficiency concept. And Professor Hansen was mainly uh, his research uh, was mainly devoted to the methodical problems, so calculations, econometric tests, and so on. So this is the theoretical point. Um, 
also they developed, as we said, the methods which in reality determined the whole shape of research for years. Uh, this, the findings were highly influential from practical and academical point of uh, point of view. Moreover, uh, as it was mentioned by the Nobel Committee, uh, there was some kind of fruitful interplay from uh, uh, on, on the one hand, it was some kind of theoretical work, so the concept, ideas and the empirical work. Uh, so the uh, attempt uh, um, to, to introduce these theoretical problems into real life, uh, into our, our economic life. Uh, but uh, there was some kind of problem because uh, um, views of Professor Fama and Professor Schiller are quite opposite uh, with regard to the efficient market um, hypothesis. So the, given the, uh, the shared uh, Nobel Prize to them uh, was a bit controversial and it is it was said that it is like awarding the Nobel Prize in Physics uh, to Ptolemy for his theory that the Earth is the center of our universe and on the other hand at the same time to Copernicus for showing that it is not. So economics is a really quite specific type of science that contrarian views might be awarded the joint as a shared Nobel uh, Prize uh, at the same at the same time. But this is as usually in economics we discuss, we have a different views on uh, on different problems. So maybe the the first point I would like to move on to this discussion of Professor Fama uh, achievements. Uh, his scientific um, his scientific interests are focused on various fields of study. So mainly here here you can see. Uh, the photo of Professor Fama and his scientific forecast interest. Sorry, uh, it is asset pricing mainly. So it is what he was given a Nobel Award for forecasting asset prices, but also corporate finance and agency uh, theory. So it is a really a uh, man of various interests. Here you can see also his most important publication. It was some kind of a review article written in 70s. Efficient Capital Markets Review of Theory and Empirical Work. And uh, now you may see the importance of this, uh, of this research because when I was looking for the number of citations or quotations of this, uh, of this paper, uh, the Google Scholar showed me that it was uh, 23, almost uh, 24,000 um, this time. So you can see that it was a very, uh, very influential or highly influential uh, paper it determined in reality the shape of the research in asset pricing for years. And now I would like to show you, uh, I call this slide a brief history of time. So we are going to briefly discuss the evolution in time of the concept of market efficiency. Uh, so the roots of the idea of market uh, efficiency, uh, they are in 19th uh, century, it is a work written by a French, uh, French broker Nyon. Then we have the famous papers of Bachelier. And now you can see also the, um, the names of uh, our uh, modern economists. So Professor Fama, Professor Samuelson, Professor Mandelbrot, and so on. And we are going to go through the lecture, through the first part of the lecture according to this scheme. We are going to discuss the views of these people on the problem of asset pricing and market efficiency. But the first and the most important thing is to uh, to avoid simply misunderstanding of the whole problem is to determine what do we uh, mean when we say market efficiency because uh, market efficiency might be understood quite differently this is a very broad concept in economics. So um, as a result, uh, we have to be very precise. And uh, I would like to show you this classification um, of uh, types of market efficiency, uh, which was introduced. This distinction was introduced by another very famous and, uh, and also a Nobel laureate, Professor Joseph Stiglitz. Uh, and 
here we can see that efficiency might be treated in at least three uh, different ways. So first thing uh, we may think about when talking about efficiency, we may think about the so-called exchange efficiency. In other words, transaction efficiency. What means that all the transactions when we are going uh, into the uh, financial market, we want to buy something, sell something, uh, the transaction might be conducted without any problems, with minimum uh, transaction costs, without delay. Uh, we always can find a counterparty. So if we want to buy, we are always uh, able to find someone uh, desiring to sell particular asset and so on. So this means that the exchange of assets, exchange of this subject of our transaction uh, can change its owner without any problems, without any uh, additional uh, problems, without any delay. So this is the first meaning of the word efficiency, exchange efficiency, transaction efficiency. Then we have the second term lying behind efficiency. It is the so-called production or allocation efficiency. It is absolutely different from the exchange efficiency because it is um, it is a concept uh, introduced by Italian economist Wilfredo Pareto. Uh, this is the most common meaning of efficiency in economics. So in this case, we are thinking about ways to achieve our purposes, our aims, maybe our targets, even better word, how to achieve our target with minimum cost, for example. So this is the first part of the um, role of rationality. So how to combine uh, all, the, uh, all the resources to get the maximum effect. This is the production efficiency, the Parisian uh, meaning of efficiency. And the third one, and we are going to deal with this meaning of efficiency, it is the so-called information efficiency. Uh, and uh, when thinking about information efficiency, we understand that it is uh, it, it was developed uh, regarding the way of transferring information, how the information is uh, included in the prices, how it is transferred from one party uh, of transaction to the another, uh, because agents have to take decisions, investment decisions, financial decisions, and so on. But to take these decisions, to make any decision, you have to have appropriate knowledge or sufficient knowledge to make this decision. As a result, information efficiency deals with the problem of transferring this information uh, and um, we, may, we may say revealing it to a various and wide audience of our economic agents. And we are going to deal with this third one. So we are going to think uh, if we, if you, if you are going to think about inf efficiency, you should think about information efficiency during our lecture. And maybe now uh, I would like to present you a few historical uh, insights into the problem of uh, market efficiency because it seems that the concept of market efficiency is very closely uh, related to modern times, so 20th century or the second part of 20th century. It is not true. Because as you can see, in the second part of 19th century, a French broker, Rignot, he wrote a book about calculations, uh, about probability on the stock exchange, and he concluded uh, what is most important thing, that uh, um, when buyers and sellers come into the market, uh, all the information they are, they are expecting, they are predicting, must be contained in the current Price because otherwise it would be possible to get additional or, or to earn additional unjustified profit. So this uh, way of um, mixing the expectations, mixing the views of different participants of the market results in the fact that all these expectations, all these future events which are predictable, which are forecastable, are included in the current price and as a result what is bolded there is no difference between value and price so value is simply determined by the price there is no necessity of introducing another concept value 
into consideration. Simply price, price is the king, we may say in this case. Uh, then we are going uh, to the very famous, if you are going to deal with uh, uh, modeling of asset prices, uh, this is a really uh, some kind of milestone in financial economics. We have the uh, Theorie de la Speculation written by uh, Louis Bachelier. Uh, it was uh, right at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, here we have reflected the same idea. He also noted, maybe he read the book of Renewal, but we do, not know, we do not know that all the events, past, present, but also the future ones, they are discounted and they are reflected in current market price. So uh, as you as you can see, all the information uh, flows, it flows quite freely to all the participants of the market and it is almost immediately uh, revealed to all of them. So no one has any advantage all over other uh, market participants. And now we are jumping to the uh, 20th century to works of such famous, uh, such a famous economist as Professor Paul Samuelson, who wrote two, uh, two papers um, in 60s and 70s devoted to the problem of um, predicting prices. And uh, here you, here you have the very similar notion of um, information efficiency. What he observed is that chartism. So technical analysis, so all the analysis based on past prices, volumes and so on were quite insufficient. They were, uh, the, the analysts using uh, chartism and technical analysis, they were unable to beat the market. They were unable to create or to observe any profitable pattern usable in predicting prices in future. So simply a forecasting future based on past prices was impossible. As a result, what he concluded, the market must have uh, discounted, must have included all the knowable future information in the current prices. And it is in this way said, all the events casting the shadows before them are taken into account by the wise, smart and clever market participants. So this is quite similar uh, understanding of the uh, of the market efficiency of the concept of market efficiency and finally we are coming to uh, works of uh, Eugene Fama his uh, a PhD dissertation the behavior of stock market prices and many really many articles and papers and uh, working papers devoted to the problem of uh, predicting the prices and the problem of fluctuations on the financial market and here we have the modern definition of um, of efficiency of the market here we have actual prices reflecting all effects all future events uh, that have already occurred or uh, which are going to take which are going to take place in the future which are predictable so we are assuming that market participants are so clever that they can all the information uh, from the past and also all the information from the future they can predict, they take them and include in the current patients. But what are the, uh, so this is the definition we may say, but what are the main, uh, what are the uh, main, mm, what are the main conclusions coming from this definition? So if market is efficient, uh, here we have one conclusion, actual price will be a very good estimate of intrinsic value. So in this case, we differentiate between price and value. We have some uh, kind of intrinsic value. So what really an, uh, a security, an instrument, an asset is worth. But now we may say that if market is efficient, price is a good estimate of this value. So we do not have to look uh, for uh, something else. We do not have to analyze uh, different uh, different uh, data. We simply may take the price and it is the very good estimate of our real value of our asset. It is the first conclusion drawn by Professor Fama and the second one is uh, because all the future information is included in the current price. So it is no possibility to predict 
future prices with better accuracy than current level of the price. So as a result, the prices should fluctuate as random numbers because there will be no pattern, no predictable uh, movement on the market. Finally, we simply cannot predict the stock exchange. Of course, and here is uh, here is uh, it is uh, this paper is connected with the previous one. Uh, it is it was written four years uh, uh, later uh, in cooperation with other economists. In uh, this case, they were analyzing uh, not the static um, situation because previously we were talking about the static situation. So the prices. Uh, include or reflect all the information. It is a static point of view. We are checking what is included in the prices, but we do not analyze how the prices are moving um, in time. This is a different point of view because now we are analyzing the adjustment of stock prices to new information. So how the price responds to the new information coming to the market. Of course, because uh, market efficiency definition said that uh, all this information should be included in the prices, uh, efficient market means that all the information coming onto the market. So, for example, we got the information that the coronavirus is spreading over some area. If this information uh, comes to the uh, financial market, it should be, if market is efficient, uh, it should be almost immediately, very, very fast, rapidly, instantaneously. Uh, it should be included in the current prices. And what was the idea lying behind this whole study? Uh, the question, the problem posed was whether or what is the uh, the speed of adjustment uh, the, of the prices to the newly incoming information. It was a problem posed on this in this paper. And what was the subject of analysis? It was observed in the past that the splitting the shares, because sometimes when prices of shares are too high, it is quite convenient to make them lower simply to replace one share with two, uh, two ones and so on and so on. So it was observed that in the past, the splits were very frequently accompanied by significant dividend increases. So you should have in mind now, oh ho, the split is occurring, the dividend will go up. This is the first fact. The second one is that companies, they are increasing dividends only if they are very, very strongly convinced that it will be possible to maintain this situation in the future because companies do not like lowering uh, dividends paid to the uh, shareholders. They want rather to um, to have them stable, and if they raised uh, dividends, they are not eager to lower them. So, uh, combining these two facts, we may say if a company splits its shares, it is a sign of significant dividend increase, and because companies uh, want uh, the um, dividends uh, have on the stable level, this increase will be persistent. So the dividends will be rising uh, in the future. This this is the, the main conclusion based on these two facts. So you have to think about it in this way. Split means increase in dividends in the future. So of course, increased dividends means increased or additional cash flow to the shareholders. As a result, they are getting additional or abnormal rate of return over what was expected. OK, so having this one uh, conclusion uh, based over two fact, on two facts in mind, we may, uh, we may go to the study. And here we have, uh, here we have uh, on, the, on the chart, on the graph, we have the numbers of months. It is the month relative to split. So here we have. Uh, month of the split is denoted by zero. We have five months after split, 10 months after split, and so on. And with the minus sign, the negative numbers show you the preceding, the, uh, show you the uh, months preceding to the, or prior to the uh, split. So five months before the split, 10 months before the split, and so on, and so on. And 
uh, these four economists, they analyzed what was the additional uh, or abnormal rate of return uh, earned um, uh, using this information. So whether the market participants were able to earn additional profit using this information. And now let's take a look. Uh, now you can see that the prices of the shares were rising um, a long period before the split. So the split is announced somewhere here. It is announced one month or two months before the real split, so somewhere here. And here you have the rising prices. So uh, this information of the split of possibly rising dividends were included in the prices long, long ago before even anyone can think of the split. And then here we have the split. So the dividends, everything is uh, now everything is clear. The announcement is made. And then, yeah, we can see that there is no rise. We have no additional return to the shareholders. What is the main conclusion based on this graph? That this information shown by this um, uh, vertical line, the split was included 25, 20, 15 or 10 months before it happened. So market participants were so clever, so uh, they had so powerful forecasting abilities that before uh, one year, two years or even almost three years before the split, they were able to observe the situation on the market, the situation of the company and um, deduct that something good is happening in the company, that the prices will go up. So of course, this information about split was almost immediately, instantly reflected in the prices. As a result, we may conclude that the market was highly, uh, that the market was highly, uh, was highly efficient, we may say. Um, yeah, this, this might be omitted maybe. Um, and now we have uh, this um, review article written by Fama I told you previously. Uh, Efficient Capital Market Review of Theory and Empirical Work. It is some kind of milestone. Uh, it, is, it is very important from our um, point of view as uh, analysts of financial market. Uh, why? Because it was emphasized this first sentence. Um, and here is, here is the combination of these two meanings of efficiency, the production or allocation efficiency and information efficiency. Because let's think about this in this way. When agents, economic agents, economic participants of the market, uh, investors, producers, consumers, and so on, when they are making any decision, they should have appropriate uh, information to make these decisions. So um, efficient allocation of capital requires uh, having at your disposal uh, appropriate, correct, up-to-date information about the current situation in the economy. Uh, and as a result, um, the market efficiency from this information point of view is in reality necessary to reach allocation efficiency. Why? Because without uh, appropriate information, without up-to-date information, we are unable to make correct decisions. So if we have some kind of flawed or some kind of incorrect information, simply we may take inappropriate decisions, wrong decisions, and misallocate or allocate in uh, improper manner our resources. As a result, as a society, we will lose on this, uh, on this inappropriate economic uh, decisions. Okay, uh, so here you have, uh, here you have the formal statement of this, uh, of this situation. So here you have the expected price in the future. This E with T uh, is expected future price. We may say it is current price multiplied by one plus expected rate of return. It is very general, so uh, so it is uh, it is um, no no necessity to comment it. 
but what is more important is this equality. Here we have in the brackets, we have a real rate of return uh, minus the expected one. So here we have the difference, abnormal rate of return over our expectations, over our justified expectations. And on efficient capital markets, this difference should be zero. So as a result, we cannot use this. This uh, FIT is the information set. So all past prices, information about companies, uh, um, uh, level of assets, profitability, return on uh, return on equity, and so on, names of the managers, and so on. This is a set of all the informations available to the investors. If a market is efficient, uh, we get abnormal rate equal to zero. Uh, so as a result, it might be concluded that using this information set, we were unable, our forecasting abilities were too poor to get any additional, um, any additional profit. So what is the best choice to us in this case? Simply buy an asset and hold it without any, uh, without any sophisticated strategies. Simply buy and Old. So according, we may say, uh, according to various types of this set of information used to predict the prices, Hama distinguished three forms of market efficiency, three forms of informationally efficient market. If all the past prices, if fee includes all historical prices, so all information about past prices, volumes, uh, transactions uh, which took place in past, if all this information is included in current prices, we may say that market is weakly efficient. If additionally, uh, this set includes all publicly knowable information, all publicly available information. So for example, names of the managers, um, level of earnings, level of cash flows, um, financial statements, information about, for example, for example, cooperators, vendors uh, and so on, we may say that the market is semi strongly efficient and it is um, there is um, uh, there is it is or it is widely accepted such a such a statement that markets are generally weakly efficient. It is rather unquestioned this uh, uh, this statement in case of semi strong efficiency that are some uh, so there, are, there is some evidence that the market sometimes might be semi-strongly inefficient. And here we have the strongest form of, of efficiency. In this case, all information, even, uh, even uh, uh, this uh, knowable only to the managers, for example, for, for example, sorry. Uh, so all the information, even this not uh, publicly available is, inclu is uh, included, influences the market. Prices. So this form of market efficiency is mainly rejected. We uh, we we reject as economists this this form of efficiency as our uh, as our research shows. So we may say that market efficiency it is not an absolute term. It is gradable. We may uh, differentiate among various levels of informationally efficient capital market. Yeah, all this. Ideas were included in the very famous Foundations of Finance written by Fama. Uh, we are not going to, to discuss it. The same, the same conclusions were included in his following papers, for example, devoted to predicting inflation, uh, inflation and so on. But the notions of market efficiency are quite the same as previously. And now I would like uh, to make a very simple, uh, to make a very simple um, exercise with you. I would like to show you what is the mechanism of market clearing according to Fama? So let's differentiate. We have the true prices, so the price which is drawn from a true, prob a true probability distribution. It is, we may say, our economic reality. We do not have um, any influence on it, on it. Simply the prices are shown to us and they are as they are. Yeah. And then we have the uh, because when you are coming to the market, you have some kind of expectation in your mind. So you think whether the prices will go up, whether they will go down and so on. And all these expectations 
your your own expectations are included in this uh, density probability uh, about future cost of events on the market. And now we have to um, contrast these two notions, um, these two types of um, distributions. Yeah, the first one, the real one, and what you have in your mind. So what is the mechanism? When you are going to the market, you have some kind of expectation about the market in your uh, in your head, in your mind. So you are going to the market and OK, let's assume that you are thinking prices will go up. So of course. You think uh, that uh, the best decision for you to make is simply to buy the shares because they are going up. So the next step is simply you are placing a market order on the market, a buying uh, order because you want to buy the shares. Of course, you are um, taking this decision based on your uh, strong, that you are strongly convinced that the prices will go up. Then, uh, so you are going to the market, your colleagues are going to the market, uh, the investors are going to the market, and we have the play of demand and uh, supply. As a result, we may draw the demand curve, as you know from, uh, from economics. We may, of course, draw the supply curve. And as a result, the price is, the final price is set. We have equilibrium, we have, we have uh, equal demand and supply, and we have equilibrium on our market. The current market price is, uh, is set. And now, uh, um, you should remember that uh, the whole process started with your expectations about the future. And now we are waiting one uh, period and the true, it was your expectations. Now it, uh, it is necessary to confront your expectations with the reality. Now the true market price is drawn from the distribution and we have to compare it. Whether your expectations, your as a market, as in some kind of average, were correct or incorrect. And this is where uh, efficiency uh, um, is revealed. Because if your expectations were good, they were uh, correct, and they, uh, and they are close to the real prices, so we may say that you used all available information and you used it correctly, the market is efficient. So you have on average uh, the potential to forecast, to predict um, in an appropriate way, the future prices, the future cost of events. And this is the whole, uh, and this is the whole notion of the market. Of course, in this case, the uh, rate of return expected by you as a market participant and the rate of return expected um, from the real distribution, from real economic conditions are the same. What does it mean? It means that we do not have any opportunity to realize to earn abnormal rate of return. So simply you cannot beat the market. This is the main conclusion uh, regarding this part of our uh, this part of our uh, of our lecture. And now I would like you uh, now I would like you to um, Mm, to do some exercise with me. Uh, I used the uh, questions and in, in the part of questions and answers, here you have the Google form. I would like you to answer now. So uh, if you have your smartphones or you are sitting in front of your computer, please enter this, uh, please enter this uh, um, link and you may uh, and you may uh, see something like this. Here is the uh, the form of uh, which I uh, which um, which I sent you. It is the very famous uh, Keynesian beauty context. Because it was said, I will describe it to you. Uh, what is what is the thing about? Um, John Maynard Keynes, so another famous economist, he said that. Functioning of the financial market is like a beauty contest. So choosing the uh, most beautiful person among others. So um, in this case, but but what is the main difference? 
he said that in case of financial market, we do not, we are not uh, finding uh, the most attractive, the most beautiful face. Yeah, from from uh, we do not have any objective criteria, but we are uh, we are um, choosing the people who have most popular faces. So we are thinking what others will think is most uh, beautiful or most popular. So now you can see we are self referencing. We are thinking about ourselves. Investors think uh, about the other investors action. And now is the main game. You are asked to write a number between zero and 100. Yeah, each of you is going to write a number between zero and 100. But please, while choosing the number, while picking this number, uh, think about it in this way. The price will be given to those of you who is closest to two thirds of the average value. So what is the course of event after the uh, after you will give me the numbers, I will calculate the average, simple arithmetic average of all your answers, and the uh, and the price will be given to these people who are closest, but not to the average, but to approximately 66% of the average. So please now, here you have the place to put the number from 0 to 100. It must be uh, an integer value. So please put here this value from 0 to 100 and have in mind your target. You have to be closest to two thirds of the average of all the average um, of all the average values. So please do it now. Here you have uh, uh, using the um, MS Teams uh, software. Here you have the link. I, I published the link to you to this Google form. Now you may answer it. And in a minute, we'll gather the information and um, and you will see what we will repeat, of course, this situation. So you will see what is the course of events, similar course of events on the market. Uh, so now you can feel like um, investors on the financial market. So please do it now. You have one or two minutes to choose to pick a number and uh, and send it to me using this Google form. Okay, I will give you a f maybe one or two minutes, yeah, because because if someone have uh, if someone has troubles with with smartphone or or whatever, we may wait a uh, uh, thirty seconds addition additionally thirty seconds, and we'll check it in a minute. And this is. This this um, idea of the clinician beauty contest is very very uh, is very very uh, illustrative how the um, financial market uh, functions. Yeah, it is it is very good a very good illustration to the functioning the the capital market and the concept of market efficiency. So we have six answers. We are waiting uh, maybe uh, 20 seconds for, for the remaining ones and we'll check our answers. And we'll we'll take a look at the at them. Uh, we'll discuss the results and uh, of course we'll have a second round of this voting. Yeah. So now we have. Okay. Now we have. Uh, now we have uh, six results from you. We may we may put it somewhere here into the Excel file. Yeah, and here you can see the results. So the average value was uh, 41.5. Yeah, so th it was it was the average value uh, 41.5. Yeah, here you, here you have the distribution of your answers. So one person uh, chose the number. Uh, between 75 and 81 on the uh, second um, end of this interval and some of you in the middle. So here we have 40, uh, 41.5 is the uh, average. We may of course calculate it once again, uh, once again uh, here. Uh, sorry, it, it is the average, it was the median. So now we are calculating two thirds of this value we multiplied by two, sorry, by two third. 
and by two uh, two third, and we have that uh, the two third of the uh, of the mean of the average was twenty nine points. So the persons we have two persons who chose uh, thirty three, and we may say that those two persons are winners of our contest because they were the closest to this two third. Yeah, to this two third of our average. Uh, to, of our average value. So they are the winners now. But uh, as you know, the financial market uh, functions continuously. Yeah, it, it doesn't stop uh, at some point because over the whole world we have uh, uh, almost continuously functioning financial markets. So please, based now you have additional information. Now you know how you and your colleagues um, uh, chose the numbers previously. So please do it once again now. So please uh, use this link once again and choose one number between zero and one hundred now. Based uh, now you are you have reached a set of information information set sorry because you know how you and your colleagues voted previously. So you may use this information to make your guesses. Yeah. So simply please do it now. We'll wait up to a minute. And we'll check the second round, second round of our beauty contest. As you see, in this case, it is not uh, the man uh, who is closest to the average, but who is closest to the two third of average. So you have to take in mind that you are not uh, you are not going to choose the number closest to the average, but the average multiplied by approximately 66 percent. So please have it in mind. You know how your colleagues voted, what were the numbers chosen during our previous vote, and now you may do the same. So please do it now and we will check your answers in 30 seconds because I suppose that there is no problem with uh, with with voting, with choosing the, the, the numbers. So here you, here you have all of them. Here you have all the information. Here you have links. So please, uh, please, uh, uh, please send it now. The rules are the same as previously. The only difference is that you have additional information. And what is most important now? You have additional piece of information, and this is the most important thing. This is the most important difference between this stage and the previous one. Okay, we have three, and uh, and the three remaining persons uh, are asked to to vote. If you wish. So please vote now. Please choose the number now. And we'll check your answer in a minute. This is in reality how the financial market functions. We are not uh, guessing what is going to happen in a real economy sometimes. We are simply guessing what is going to happen on the financial market. So what will be our future actions? We are self referencing it is a self referencing self uh self referencing mechanism okay so we have four answers now sorry they are a little bit different than previously so we may copy them to the excel uh what can be observed now here we have we we'll choose the second what 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 we may observe? We have we do not have any additional values. No, we do not have. Uh, what can we see? The mean or the, the the median, the central value is lowered. So the value is um, is diminishing because what you uh, what you observe that your uh, most of your bets previously of your choices previously were too high. So you chose the lower values. And of course, now we may see one person who chose 66, I suppose, and three of you who chose approximately 20. As a result, uh, uh, as a result, we may calculate. Sorry, as a result, we may calculate here. We may calculate here the average value. We have the average. Sorry for uh, non-English values, but and here we have this value multiplied by two third, and we have that approximately 23 is the uh, two third of the average. So 
one person chose 23 and you are the winner. Congratulations. It is your time. Uh, you chose 23 and exactly we have 23 as our result. And finally, this is the last round. We are going because at least three of them are um, necessary to show you the, the effect. So please, you have the information about the first voting. Yeah, this one. You have the information about the second one. Please now do it once again. It is, I promise, it is the final one. It is the last voting. You are, uh, you are, uh, it is the last time you are choosing the number. Please think about it once again. And now you have to do uh, the same as previously. So choose the number which is the closest to two thirds of average. And now, and now we will check the, the answers. Because as you can see, the really difference, the really only difference is that you have different set of information when during the first voting, you didn't have any idea what your colleagues um, could choose. After the first one, you uh, knew what your colleagues uh, chose, yeah, and you, you um, could have adjusted your answer to this uh, set of inf information set. Now you have results of the two rounds of voting, two rounds of the, our beauty contest, and you have additional piece of information. So this is the main, uh, and, and now in a moment we are going to reach a, a conclusion about the whole contest, and I suppose we don't have enough time, but I suppose a few minutes, uh, yes, so we'll, we'll make a short comment and, and, and discuss the result of, of it. We have two additional ones. So please vote now. Uh, here in uh, uh, MS Teams, you have uh, the link. So please use it. And we'll have our results in a minute. And we may check what is going uh, to be a, a final voting result in a minute. Of course, you may observe the same uh, behavior on the market. Yeah. Sometimes there are no new information coming from the real economy, which influences the participants, but simply another investor said something. And the it was important investor, for example, I don't know, some kind of uh, huge investment bank representative or someone else. And uh, it causes a great turmoil or great, um, uh, or great movement on the market. So this is, this is how it how it works. So uh, I hope that you gave the results. OK, now we have three of them. Yeah, and now we may see what is your average. Your average of this three result is 16 point, uh, 16 and one, one third. And now we are calculating this value multiplied by two third. It is almost 11. So uh, two person uh, predicted uh, were the closest or made closest uh, forecasts uh, of 16. Yeah, was the, oh, and we have 10, but it is after time and 21. Yeah, so maybe the values are coming with some kind of uh, some kind of delay. So maybe let's include these late values in our calculation. So B14, B16, and and our values are almost unchanged. So now wins the person who chose uh, 10 as a value. Yeah. So this is the person who won our contest. Now we may copy the results and I will show you what was the uh, what was the situation in this case. So now what we, we may we see? OK, so we, we, we may do it in this way. OK. It will be the visibility will be approved. So what is the course of events? Now you can see the average value is falling. It's constantly falling. Why it is falling? Because of this, uh, because of this assertion that two thirds of the average. So each bet in the future should be lower than the previous ones. It is rational, yeah, because we are calculating some kind of average and we are multiplying by two thirds. So uh, the lower values are better in this case. So of course you uh, observed this fact, so you used this information appropriately. And uh, in the first voting, we had um, the information was spread over different values. Yeah, 
we had almost 60 or almost uh, um, 52 values and almost 60 and so on. Here we can see that the difference between the highest and the lowest uh, bets are diminishing. And finally, if you observe the values in case of the third drowning, all of you noticed that it is best to, first thing, lower your bet, so to choose the lowest values. And the second one, all of you noticed it. So all your, uh, your, uh, your choices here are quite close. They are, yeah, we have the greatest difference is 11. So it is approximately 16 plus minus five. So they are really very close. If we, for example, consider that in the first voting, you had 15 and 80. So you gained this knowledge. You used this knowledge about previous, um, about previous, um, contests uh, correctly. So now we may say the market for our beauty contest is efficient. Why? Because you used the information you got. You used all the information because you used all the values given by your colleagues and you used it correctly. So you correctly processed the information and as a result, uh, this information uh, was correctly used. It was all the information used market for our beauty contest is efficient, so I may congratulate you uh, um, observing the right facts on our very small market created by me. So maybe if we have time, uh, maybe a few additional uh, remarks about the uh, myths. Yeah, I know that the time is... Uh, uh, is no, no, there is no, prob no problem no with problem. time. Okay, okay. Sorry. So maybe I would like to make a few uh, remarks maybe about the myths regarding market efficiency and a few words about ideas presented by Professor Robert Schiller. And I suppose it will be all. So here we have the common myths about market efficiency. So um, it is widely, um, it is widely, uh, um, it, it is quite common. It can be observed in the press, in the intern on the internet and so on that such a claim that because efficient market theory predicts that we are unable to beat the market, yeah, uh, it is the main prediction of the market uh, efficient market theory, but we have a group of investors systematically beating the market, reaching abnormal rates of return. So, for example, Warren Buffett, George Soros, Peter Lynch, and so on. So, uh, people think so efficient market theory must be false because we have people who uh, get abnormal rates of return. But unfortunately, this way of reasoning is false, even if you choose. Uh, so, as I said, the first myth regarding the efficient market theory is that it is uh, the prediction of the EMH is uh, we are, um, we are, we cannot beat the market in a systematic way. But we can observe such investors as Warren Buffett, George Soros, Peter Lynch, and so on. Uh, which uh, are able to beat the market because they reached, they, they um, accumulated great wealth um, uh, um, while speculating on the market. So it is, it is concluded that efficient market theory must be false because there are people who are able to systematically beat the market. But let's think in this uh, way about the whole thing. Even if we choose our investment strategies at random, um, it was such kind of experiment um, used, uh, prepared using monkeys, yeah, uh, which uh, absolutely randomly, simply by clicking on the keyboard, chose the uh, securities. Uh, there were groups of um, securities, of portfolios, of um, such kind of simulated investors, we may say, who were able to uh, reach abnormal rate of return systematically. It is simply the illusion of randomness. Uh, such, such kind of a process might be random and it appears to us as non-random, as some kind of we are as human beings, we are finding everywhere uh, knowable patterns. And this is such kind of illusion because there is no pattern, only our brain says us, hey, right, there is a pattern in the, in, the, in the prices and so on. So it is only a myth. The second one, uh, yeah, because uh, all the information is included in the price, it is absolutely useless to conduct uh, financial analysis. But nevertheless, 
financial analysts uh, exist, they work. So market theory, efficient market theory must be solved. But here is forgotten what is crucial. It is due to the work of financial analysts that the market is efficient. Because this information about companies to be included in the prices, firstly, must be uh, gained. It must be revealed. So firstly, we have to conduct analysis. Then this information is, is transferred through the financial market to other participants. Maybe the possibility of gaining, of reaching an enormous profit is very small, but it still exists as, a, uh, as the average. Of course, we do not have additional uh, abnormal rates of return, but it means only that there are, there are analysts who reach abnormal rates of return, so who gain some additional values. And we have also, on the other hand, analysts who, who lose simply on average we have and the third myth in the efficient market it is assumed that all the investors are well informed and very very smart but in reality most of the investors are not experts in finance so efficient market theory must be false it is absolutely not true why it is not true it is sufficient for the financial market to be efficient that there exists a small group of people who are able to transform the information into prices and because this information is revealed by them all of the remaining investors include them in their prices and in the final price so it is not necessary uh, that the all investors must be experts in finance yeah it is only sufficient that there exists a small group of informed and smart investors who are finance experts the rest of them will follow them simply and this will also create efficient market and maybe only a two words or three about professor schiller yeah here is also a short break but also we may say uh coming to an end yeah wall street says at the next floor down how the wall street is perceived by common people we may say and by us and here we have professor robert schiller he invented the idea of irrational exuberance uh, what does it mean? It is the graphical presentation is like this. So we have manias, panics on the financial market. We have, as it, as it was said by uh, Chairman Greenspan, we have irrational exuberance. So we have waves of optimism and pessimism, as can be seen right from this uh, picture taken from a paper. Uh, so, so we can see the uh, selling wave so the prices plummeting and then buying wave and prices peaking going up and this is uh, what he says he is concerned about speculative bubbles so a situation when news increases investors enthusiasm and as a result it is like coronavirus we have uh, we have spreading contagion among the people all of them react in the same way so all are selling or all buying as a result, the speculative bubble uh, is created according to the Professor Schiller. Uh, and here you have the, uh, the visual presentation of it. Here we have the bubble, what, what he calls bubble in case of home prices. So what led to the 2007-2009 uh, financial uh, crisis? We may omit it. Uh, there is also a controversial because Professor Fama says, but which part of this movement is bubble which is not and he shows in our case um this is the uh, us market index which part is bubble which is not this part is bubble yeah here right here uh this movement up or this movement up we do not know so there is a controversy between those economists whether uh, in reality bubbles exist or not but concluding, what we may say, the only thing we know about the financial market is that it is absolutely not so simple to gain additional profits, to earn money in a free, um, without any additional costs, without additional work devoted to our uh, analysis and to careful, uh, careful consideration of all the events influencing the, uh, the prices. So, what we may say um, while uh, ending this part of our, our lecture, it is that 
financial market is some kind of miracle. It functions rather smoothly and uh, and appropriately for the for most of the time. Sometimes it causes uh, very huge problems, but uh, without this financial market, we would be like uh, people in the dark. We wouldn't know what is the right direction. Whether um, the direction is not absolutely correct, yeah, but we know the general is a general direction of our work, uh, and this is the main function of financial market. So simply providing. Uh, providing the economic agents information about assets, about investment possibilities, which will make in the future the uh, allocation correct and increasing our future wealth as a society, as a as a whole community. So I suppose that it is the best because our time is coming to the end. Uh, it is the best way to uh, to to finish this um, part of our lecture. And now, if you have any questions, uh, please do not hesitate to ask them. I will answer uh, your questions. If you have any ones, of course, you may uh, write to me. Of course, using my uh, my email, uh, which I uh, will uh, will give you using uh, using the questions and answers. Uh, part so, yeah. Please feel free to ask about about uh, issues connected with market efficiency. Okay, Rafael. Thank you for yeah. the for the lecture. Thank yeah, you thank you very much. Week, and especially, especially the survey. Unfortunately, there was just few students responding, but I think yeah, of course I know. But due to some problems, of course it it always happens as far as I know. But it was the results were quite. Uh, quite as I predicted, and it it, it was uh, perfectly it perfectly um, allowed me to show what I wanted. So it was it was great, even if the students, the number of the students were was not uh, um, as huge as as maybe uh, sometimes might be. So everything's okay. Okay. So are there are there any questions? If there are any questions, please write them to the questions to the comments and questions section, so that we can read them and answer them. Okay. There are two questions, so I will publish them so everybody can mm -hmm. read them. Uh, well, actually, the first one is the question, the second one is the feedback. The first one, what do you think? Is it better to invest actively mm -hmm. in investment or passively to invest in some index or ETF? Uh, from my point of view, uh, yeah, we know that sometimes exists uh, uh, some additional uh, possibilities and extra possibilities. For example, if we have companies which invented uh, a vaccine uh, against COVID, yeah, so it would be absolutely um, unwise not to uh, not to use this possibility, not to use this opportunity to invest. So sometimes it is quite wise to use these opportunities to invest actively, but most of the time, I uh, I think, as it is my point of view, I invest passively. I simply follow uh, follow the index, follow the crowd, we may say. But it doesn't, uh, in my mind, um, I do not exclude the possibility of catching uh, this uh, this uh, additional opportunities. Yeah. So I, I I think that it is some kind of balance, uh, some kind of balance between these two uh, two uh, two views. Okay. Uh, and the second, there is a more or less comment that mm -hmm. the students want to thank you for the presentation, that it was interesting. So, if there are, are there any more questions? Probably not. So, if there, if there are any more questions, the students have your email. So, they yeah, can of course. The, the question to the, to the email. So, once more, thank you very much for the lecture. Thank you very much um, for the possibility of uh, of presenting uh, these ideas and thank you to the students for the participation and it it was very nice that you found uh, this lecture a little bit interesting to you so it 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 was great I, I I suppose that in this case if you say that it was a little bit interesting or even more uh, my uh, my target was my purpose my aim was achieved so so it's it's great and thank you very much thank you very much once again for for creating such a great uh, opportunity to share uh, this uh, this ideas with with the students. So see you see you next year on International Week again. Hopefully. See you.
Thank you very much and okay. have a nice day. Have a Good. nice week. Goodbye. Bye bye.